So as most of you know, I don't finish my talks on time. Uh, I think I have around 20 minutes, somebody will indicate. But I do start with, uh, I think the people that I get a chance to work with, it's none of us work alone, as Alicia just said. Um, I run a lab at Stanford. Uh, many of the people listed here, uh, uh, they've been long-term partners, uh, players, many of them that have gone on to do all kinds of wonderful stuff, take many of the threads and ideas on frugal science and much of the philosophy um, and derive uh, many, many other projects itself. So uh, everything that you hear is work uh, with the fantastic group of people. And actually, some of them happen to be in this room, too. Uh, Okay, so I think if you want to take anything away from this talk, uh, I want you to take this. Uh, it's complex to think about. Uh, uh, this is a Sudanese saying, uh, Marwan, who is a student in my class, a class that I teach called Frugal Science, told me um, in one of our conversations. He said, the pen, let's not make the pen that does not eradicate ignorance and shame. Uh, and it has a very deep meaning in the context of uh, the culture itself, but uh, what it really represents is this idea that technology, the pen is a representation of technology. If we are to create sets of technologies, they really have to eradicate ignorance and shape. Uh, you know, I work quite a lot in health kind of a context, and many of you know uh, health technologies are not accessible. You know, insulin is being a great example, but you can go on and on. Uh, and this is one of the key challenges that while we are making incredible technological progress on this planet, it is not solving the kinds of problems that we all deeply care about, and not just people in this room. We as society care about billions of people uh, that just do not have access to solutions that we take for granted. So that's really one of the goals uh, is, is really thinking about access and keeping this in mind that we don't accidentally keep inventing technologies uh, that actually solve the problem. You know, over the last uh, 12 years, uh, I've run an academic lab. Uh, I don't see any conflict in, uh, you know, we, academia provides us a place to think and play, but eventually what truly matters is what you get out in the hands of people and around the world. And one of the things that we have to often think about uh, is, are the people that we're bringing in that fold of science uh, broad enough uh, to be able to really play a role in defining the future? And this will come up. This is a photograph. Uh, I'm probably not going to talk about this too much, but uh, this is one of the tools that we scaled up uh, called the Foldscope. This is a photograph from a village, a rural village in uh, south of Tamil Nadu. You know, this photograph gives me a lot of joy. Uh, you can see kids excited about uh, tools and technologies. Uh, but also, two million of these tools are out there for two billion kids, which also tells you sort of the gap that's associated with this. Let me walk you through certain sets of challenges. At least we focus on three pillars. One is education. Uh, a huge challenge currently is a billion kids around the world live in families that is uh, $2.5 uh, per day or less. So when we really think about solutions and the future of our planet itself, half of them don't even have a play. This is uh, literally a school, an, an average school, uh, the fact that there is a roof. Uh, this is a hospital. This is another picture that I took in Ghana. It reminds us uh, of the notion of this is actually a malaria clinic. Uh, again, roughly around a billion people have absolutely no access to how you would think about healthcare in any kind of a context. And very similarly, and many of you engaged in this process itself, environmental challenges are of the similar order or sometimes uh, even a larger order. Uh, this is uh, one of the contexts of thinking about the environmental apocalypse that we have, while we have not even been measuring many of these sets of parameters. So I'm not going to have time to talk about, uh, you know, many of these sets of fronts, but, you know, I, I lose sleep at night and I want all of you to lose sleep at night. It is important to lose sleep at night, frankly, uh, where we are as a society. Uh, and many of you uh, are already... Uh, engaging uh, and making a huge difference. But I think, you know, we have a long way to go. Um, so I think the principle of what we do is really thinking quite a lot about democratizing access. Uh, I might talk about a little bit around uh, diagnostics. Many of these projects are documented. Uh, even if I wanted to, I can't cover uh, all of them and do justice to them in any way and form. So I'll just briefly share with you some anecdotes of what we have learned. 
the first challenge was uh, almost uh, around uh, 11 years ago, I was in Uganda and met this remarkable uh, individual. We've been working on malaria for the longest time. And he told me, Manu, you should come back to me when you can do diagnosis under a tree. I don't really understand that, what he meant. And kind of, I went and, you know, over the years, I've spent a significant time in malaria regions. Um, I remember taking Tibo in a malaria region in India and realizing how incredibly intricate the social and the technological context are intertwined. Uh, and so we started thinking about this for the longest time. And I think one of the things that ends up happening is uh, the sets of tools and technologies almost have to be like pencils and pens that they can be truly distributed at scale. And manufacturing becomes an int intricate challenge. Uh, this is one that we tackled uh, during COVID for almost two and a half years with Dan Harris's lab, who's also here, was really thinking about although we can invent and publicly share medical devices in the context of open source, that does not mean uh, care to people. Uh, there is a huge intricacy in the regulatory context of thinking about what life-saving uh, platforms could mean. That led to the start of a reference design framework for medical devices. So this is an ICU ventilator. We work with three manufacturing partners, India, Nepal, and Kenya, brought them on board with the ISO standards and the FDA standards. And it was almost just a huge ordeal. But at this point, one of them is continuing manufacturing for an ICU ventilator. Uh, and one of the challenges, not all problems are solved here. Uh, one of the challenges with medical devices still remains uh, is that the regulatory standards, we don't have international regulatory standards to begin with, which is another issue that I can talk about offline. On the diagnostics, another big frontier of, you know, just thinking about COVID itself. I mean, many of you know, you can go walk out and get a COVID test. Three billion COVID tests were done uh, since, you know, 2021 and since the COVID started, but less than 0.4% of them were actually done in LMIC as a context. So that's a huge gap to be thinking about when we're talking about a pandemic, unless we have an international framework for diagnostics, I mean, many of these technologies need to be in the public health context. And most of that is really driven by that these sets of tools have not been accessible. This is really what uh, the field sites and diagnostics look like, mostly for malaria. This happens to be for COVID. And we've been thinking about many technologies in that space and slowly starting to bring them down. Uh, into open manufacturing framework while maintaining the kind of quality and regulatory approvals uh, and ownership that's actually needed for medical devices. I'll give you one example of a tool, just uh, give you a spirit of play. This started long time ago in Uganda. And one of the challenges that we faced was um, uh, sample preps require centrifugation. And, uh, you know, on the flight coming back, I was starting to think about this and we stumbled upon a toy. Uh, this happens to be, uh, I don't know how many of you played a button on a string or run run. Uh, it's the oldest toy in history of mankind. Uh, toys are phenomenal in terms of, uh, you know, think about open hardware. Uh, we make something, we share it, people build upon it. Uh, 5,000 years ago, people have found relics of this object. Uh, but you know, the irony is that we didn't understand how it works. Uh, so this is where academics come in. This is how it works. Uh, and, but it's important. You know, I think the reason it's important is you might not realize what form factor this object can take. Understanding this, uh, we are able to then build a tool that now holds the world record for the fastest spinning object with human power. Uh, and literally for 20 cents, we can do an anemia test now, which 3 billion women need around the world. We can do a malaria test on top of this. And, you know, just to share the joy of sharing technologies, uh, this is one of our clinical studies in Madagascar, in the field. You know, if you ever felt a little shy bringing your uh, first prototype out to the field, uh, this is what it feels like. And, you know, the irony of this is this is a village chief who has to approve before we can run and do any of the usability studies. And he starts very skeptic. Uh, but it's also about building technologies that don't look like black boxes, that people can understand, that people can relate to. You know, when you think about the challenges we have in the medical kind of a context. Um, and what was fun is the person that's sitting right next to her is uh, she's the nurse. She's the only woman that's allowed in that meeting. And, uh, skip this. I don't know what I'm giggling about, but 
uh, but it's a powerful moment. I just want to share this with you because often enough we miss this. Uh, we see sets of tools. What truly matters is when they get in hands of people that need them the most. Uh, Adam and a couple other people in the lab, we started thinking about COVID and that's been a huge thing. We took that set of a project and released another open uh, COVID uh, diagnostics based out of a flashlight. Uh, this is Much of this is documented, so I'm not going to spend some time, but I just want you to feel that the li tiny little objects that are around you every day can be turned around into uh, playful little inventions that actually are very meaningful. Uh, that's another centrifugation assay for COVID. Uh, I want to talk about malaria for a second. Uh, this is a data set from a patient uh, uh, from Tanzania. And one of the challenges that we've been building over is to really bring machine learning to the context of uh, 10 means I have 10 minutes or I'm over 10 minutes. Ten more. I have 10 more minutes. Ten more what? Minutes. Go for it. Whoa. Okay. I could talk on and on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, look at these pretty pictures, but these are also very deadly parasites. Uh, this is, uh, and the reason this is possible that we can do is we've been building uh, completely autonomous robotic microscopes that go out in the field uh, in the middle of the kinds of regions that um, most instrumentation doesn't even survive. Uh, and one of the factors is to really be able to pick out parasites from a single drop of blood. A single drop of blood can have somewhere of the order of 20 million cells. So the instrument is essentially imaging uh, around 5 million cells per minute. It classifies them, lots of ML applied to it. But one of the challenges that we faced out in the field when we started deploying and testing this technology, this was in the field in Assam, one of our field sites, is you notice that uh, the first thing you have to do is take a drop of blood and smear it on, and that's the conditions that these smears are made in, and this is what it actually looks like. Uh, less than 10, 20% of the slide is actually useful. So we can't get access to all the information that was smeared on that slide. Uh, so just as a, uh, as a training protocol, 200 million slides are made around the world every year. Uh, roughly around 700 million malaria tests are run. And this is what it feels like. Uh, this is blood. Uh, don't do this at home. Okay, nice uh, setting. All right. And in 200 years, yeah, so that's here's the, the that's trick that we have learned how to master. you got to get the angle right and smoosh. If you don't smoosh it right, you don't actually get a Yeah, this part's not exactly useful. And you can see a massive amount of slide is not usable. It's a huge issue. And it seems so simple. And again, going back. This is how you should do it. We could have done this 100 years ago. Landa Levich wrote down this theory that tells us how smears happen. This is much more complicated. It's a non-Newtonian fluid. Uh, but using that, we essentially built a way that anybody in the world at this point, it's completely open. A 3D printer is all you need to actually build an autonomous uh, smearing device. Uh, you first have to do experiments. This is all possible uh, velocities and angles, and you can tell there is an optima right there, but I'll just show you guys the tool. The tool uses a 17 cent syringe. We make a billion of those every year, uh, but it uses it as an actuator because what you need is a constant velocity actuator, no electronics, uh, and there is a little pinch valve right there that sets the pressure in this device. I can tune the velocity, that's what you need. Uh, and that turned into what we call inkwell. I apologize for all these industrial sounds behind. Uh, in a lab, we have to do this under a few hood. Out in the field, I'm doing this right in my hand, in my pocket. I have some of these devices that people want to play, but I'll just show you um, the simplicity of this. And around, we have 100 of these units being used for usability testing around the world, 25 sites in the world right now. Uh, we're starting to also mass manufacture this as a tool in an open context. But one of the things that philosophically we're using this tool is also explore this idea of 3D printed medical devices because it's not a life-saving kind of a device. It's pretty simple to make. Any of you who has a 3D printer, print it out, play with it. Uh, but, you know, the conceptual framework we're trying to understand with that as a tool is... Uh, 
this comes a step earlier. It's a sample prep device uh, and really explore the boundaries of uh, the regulatory process and the manufacturing side of this uh, when a technology scales up. Okay, I'm going to end with uh, work that we have done from a sustainability point of view. Uh, during COVID, something, you know, lots of strange things happened, uh, but uh, we decided to build a small scale factory that uses a cotton candy machine to make masks. And this is what that cotton candy machine looked like. We actually industrialized it. The idea was, could you make factories go viral? Uh, and suddenly we had around six countries, completely different groups testing these sets of ideas to do uh, on-demand N95 uh, and, you know, ironic, everybody knows now uh, what that material means, N95 quality material, raw material produced in the field. We work with a French company to then scale that up. The entire factory is actually open source. And we started thinking about this, that from a context of sustainability, what are the other products that we really need to make at large scale in a distributed context? Uh, and we decided to focus on menstrual pads. Uh, this room probably knows this very well, but uh, you know, 500 million women around the world still uh, don't have access to hygiene products. And when you start thinking about that, the scale of this problem is just absolutely immense. Lots of really important things have happened, uh, but it has never uh, been to a point where we haven't been able to make a big dent in that number itself. Uh, and one of the challenges is really around uh, semi-arid and arid areas. When you think about how biomass is distributed around the world, one of the challenges is only a handful of countries have most of the biomass and the rest of the world, there's very little biomass to be thinking, that is timber resources. Uh, and this became a bigger challenge. You know, banana has been used in the past, but banana doesn't grow everywhere. And our focus has really been in the Sahel region in Africa. Uh, and along the way, uh, I started thinking about an old friend of mine I had met 10 years ago who had been growing sisal, this one thing that grows everywhere in Africa. And one of the challenges is people have been trying to figure out what to do with it. You make ropes. And we decided to focus on this plant uh, to see, could we use this plant to actually make all the materials that are needed to do local manufacturing of uh, menstrual pads? And I wouldn't be here if I uh, we didn't figure that out. That's all publicly available. It's uh, uh, now, it's a chemical process uh, that is literally a mirror of what happens in the gut of a termite. But we're not using termites, just the, the principles and ideas. Uh, but, you know, long story short, we've been able to run. Uh, at this point, we're scaling up this process, but the process is completely open. Any manufacturer in the world can take these sets of ideas and build highest quality pads. I think, you know, a pad is a medical device. And one of the important things to think about is quality control associated with this. So we did a lot of work to really identify uh, the quality to be able to really beat many of the scenarios and criteria. And then we've also applied this to many other materials to really see what is the breadth of these sets of processes. Uh, there is a sustainability analysis in that to really demonstrate that local manufacturing really does beat both in cost uh, and uh, other scenarios. This has led to a consortium we're starting for researchers that are passionate about biomaterials, but really in the context of this very specific problem of uh, period poverty. Uh, we call this group plant pad. Now we have uh, members from Nigeria, Nepal, Kenya, a couple of groups in France. And then I'll just end with one picture. Uh, some of you were at the Plankton Scope workshop. Uh, Thibaut, Adam are here, and I know for uh, much of the work on the menstrual pad, Anton also was here uh, yesterday at least. Uh, and one of the challenges around uh, thinking about the oceanography side is, uh, you know, these boats are awesome, but they cost way too much. And we started thinking uh, almost uh, six, seven years ago uh, with lots of sets of partners of how to really do and bring this frugal approach to oceanography. Many of you have done these types of things, but I just want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Thibaut, Adam, and a couple of people. If you did get a chance to see a plankton scope, there are still some of them are out. Uh, at this point, we're starting to scale this project. Again, it is an open source project. Anybody can build them. Uh, but at that same time, uh, we're very focused on uh, scientifically collected data itself. So there is a huge data side of the story that we didn't get a chance to talk about. And, you know, I think sometimes it's just a joy when you build something, uh, 
you post it out, somebody else completes that cycle and st data starts coming out. Uh, and uh, this is literally the data collected uh, by uh, community members that have built those sets of instruments. You know, if we don't measure our planet, we really are in no position to be able to be thinking about any of the technologies that are being talked about from a carbon sequestration perspective. So this is a very scary road where we are taking that leap, oh, we're going to modify this planet while we have absolutely no capacity to measure the biological context of this planet. So I think this has really been one of the big focuses. And that can only be done if you bring everybody into the fold of science. Uh, I'm going to end here. Uh, I teach a class called Frugal Science. It's been really fun uh, to just mentor students from around the world. Uh, it's valuable to be thinking about this in, with a very rigorous framework in mind. Uh, and many of you have guest lectured. I'll invite more of you to give uh, talks and threads. Uh, but if you know people that are deeply interested in engaging, you know, do send them this link. And let me end with this picture. Uh, this is a picture that I took in Liberia. Uh, there's lots of work that we do in Liberia with uh, Ebola survivors, uh, diagnostics for Ebola, uh, and starting to build a, a biomedical re research framework in Liberia. The reason I love this picture is, you know, talking about a pen. Uh, many of these students are actually going to school. You can count the number of kids on this bike. Uh, but the pen here is a motorcycle. And it's remarkable to think about how this object of a motorcycle has played a role in delivering healthcare. Anybody gets sick, a motorcycle shows up. You're pregnant, a motorcycle shows up. You need a test, a motorcycle shows up. There is an accident, a motorcycle, the ambulance, any set of a thing that you think about, a motorcycle becomes that key criteria. I mean, clearly when people were inventing a motorcycle, they were not thinking about this. Uh, but you know, often enough, uh, we have to see technologies differently but also make sure that the access is available and let other people build and find uses on top of them. On a rainy day here, I would have taken this uh, uh, bike, uh, except I decided to walk. Okay, I'll end here. Uh, I don't know if there's time for questions, but I'm around the whole day today uh, and happy to 